introduce the next session, but before I do that, Malcolm wants me to read something to you. Yes. Yes, just give me the bloody thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll do my best. Dear Miss Harris, thank you to you and Ms. Bev Jackson for your email of 15th of October, kindly inviting the Prime Minister to attend the first LGB National Conference on 21st October. Prime Minister is delighted to learn of this groundbreaking event and is aware of what a truly momentous occasion this will be. Unfortunately, as I hope you will understand, it will not be possible for the Prime Minister to attend due to pressures in his diary. However, on his behalf, I would like to thank the LGB Alliance for their incredible hard work and sending my best wishes for a successful conference, Boris Johnson. women today, a lot of talented women, and now we're going to meet a woman who's brave and talented. She's brave because she is the chair of LGB Alliance, and she's talented because she's the woman who brought us bad girls. Yeah! <laughs> I've told her that I modelled myself on Helen Stewart as a prison governor, apart from the affair with Mandana Jones, but I could have been tempted. <laughs> anyway, to uh, introduce and run our next session, please welcome the chair of the LGB Alliance, Eileen Gallagher. Um, hello everyone and good afternoon and well, I mean how do you follow that? Um, that was a fantastic speech Alison, absolutely brilliant and inspires us all. Um, so yes, I'm Eileen, I'm chair of the uh, trustees, LGB Alliance. And I have to say, when I was asked by, of course, Kate Harris and Bev <laughs> to do the job, and one of the reasons I decided I really had to do it was that, you know, there's not that many people who are in my position, because I, I don't have an employer, I don't have any clients, and, you know, I, I'm not on Twitter. So I thought, I'm pretty protected. <laughs> Um, so I, I did take the job and it has become a full-time one, but I'm not complaining about that. Um, so I, I just wanted to start by first of all thanking the panel here because it's not easy being a politician and having an opposing view in something which is so inf inflammatory. Um, but also I think we should thank everyone in the room here because everyone in the panel and this conference room anyone attending is actually making a statement, all of you. And that statement is, we won't be intimidated, we won't be canceled or silenced. So I think you should give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> and I really mean it, I know how hard it is, but you're not alone and I hope everyone gets that message. So as we gather here, it's already been said, but I want to say it again, our friend and colleague and one of my fellow trustees, Kathleen Stock, is being hounded out of her campus by a mob. But Kathleen is just one of many academics, artists, lawyers, MPs, ordinary people, and even now we hear BBC staff, who are being intimidated into not speaking and not saying what they think. Now, it's already been said that the, the LGB Alliance only exists because Stonewall refused to debate when they made that fundamental change to their organisation. And let's not forget, we didn't drop the T. It was Stonewall who added it, and without any consultation. <laughs> without any debate, despite the founders and loyal supporters pleading the, with them to have that debate. So I say this because one of our founding principles of the LGB Alliance is freedom of speech, which is why we're having this session today. So on our panel, we have uh, people who've been brave and some people who've suffered quite a lot from speaking their minds, daring to disagree or just posting a tweet that the gender warriors found offensive. So the first person I'd like to introduce uh, is David Bridal. Uh, David, as I'm sure most of you will know, he was the founder of Boys Magazine and many other very celebrated gay publications. Um, and, and of course now LGB News, which is our favorite paper. 
And David has been a staunch supporter of gay rights and HIV health for over 30 years. So he's a true hero of ours. And David's story, he'll come to in a minute, but it just started with a tweet. It was just one tweet. And actually, it was drawing attention to LGB Alliance. And David had said, you know, agree or not agree, you might want to listen to what they're saying. And then the world came crashing down, and David lost most of his businesses. But anyway, David will tell you this in his own words. So, uh, David, over to you. Thank you. If you don't mind, I've actually written... Uh a speech, partly because I'm actually going to quote from a few tweets, because I thought it would just give a, a sort of bit of atmosphere at, uh, to what happens when you uh, come under attack from the trans rights activists. Um, when the cancel culture Twitter mob is coming for you, uh, it's really hard to see the wood from the trees. And that was me last November. I was in full panic mode. And the reason uh, my business, the gay men's magazine Boys, as Eileen said, uh, published by my partner, Kelvin and I, since 1991, uh, was being cancelled. In 24 hours, Boys had been boycotted by about two thirds of the London gay scene. And what brought on this onslaught? Again, as Eileen mentioned, a single tweet for an LGB Alliance webinar for gay men. Uh, the tweet said, listen yourself to the founders of the LGB Alliance and then make up your own mind. You don't have to agree, but at least hear them out. I thought our boys readers would be interested in hearing from uh, James Dreyfus, who I think is here today, and uh, Simon Fanshaw. <laughs> who were appearing on the uh, webinar. The irony was, uh, when I actually tweeted that out, I wasn't actually a supporter of the LGB Alliance. And in fact, if I'm really honest with you, I didn't even know what gender critical actually meant. <laughs> a few gay friends had, within the previous months, discussed that the community were, and I quote, throwing the lesbians under the bus. And as a journalist, I sort of wanted to know more. And I thought our boys' readers would want to know more too. But within hours, Owen Jones of The Guardian... <laughs> Obviously... <laughs> Uh, we're not a fan of Owen, but I'll tell you what he wrote. He wrote, after Boys Magazine defended an anti-trans group, the magazine should be removed from LGBTQ spaces and boycotted by advertisers. Here's another person, Scottish soap actor David Paisley. <laughs> <laughs> He tweeted, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Why? I shouldn't do that, but I just thought I should. <laughs> Why are you tweeting a hate group, Boys Magazine? Why are you tweeting a hate group, Boys Magazine? And during the course of the day, virtually every single one of the current Boys advertisers were a monthly magazine now. We used to be weekly, but we're a monthly magazine. About, usually we were, 120 pages. Um, every single one of our advertisers was targeted on Twitter by Paisley. The iconic gay pub, the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, who had advertised with us for literally decades, said they would no longer be working with us. Soho distribu distribution points, places where people can go in and pick the magazine up, Clone Zone, Prowler Shops, said they would stop stocking boys because we were supporting a hate group. Even Pride in London, who are the organisers of the London Pride March, said, we're shocked and disappointed to see Boys Magazine publicising and defending a transphobic hate group. We will no longer be working with them. And our, our, our friends over at Pink News splashed with the following headline, 
Uh, Boys Magazine faces blistering backlash after urging readers to listen to anti-trans LGB alliance. And their listen was in uh, quote marks. My business was being destroyed in front of my eyes. And the reason for that is because Boys is a free magazine. We are totally dependent upon advertisers. On the second day of this Twitter onslaught, the chief executive of the Terence Higgins Trust, the long-standing HIV and AIDS charity, asked us to apologize. Ian Green. He wrote, please, Boys Magazine, reconsider your promotion of an organization that is opposed to trans equality. He tweeted it along with a picture, trans rights are human rights, of course. Within an hour of that tweet, I had apologized. I was trying to save my business, and if the CEO of the leading HIV charity, and incidentally a major advertiser in boys, spending up to 20,000 pounds a year, and we're a small business, that's a lot of money, was asking me to apologize, then I would. And of course, as we all know, it was a big mistake. <laughs> A big mistake that I think Mayor Forstater would absolutely, uh, quite rightly, later warn everyone, really, because it is never enough. And let me tell you how it was never enough. Um, although, it, may I just mention um, that what I was trying to do is save my staff's jobs. Uh, I've got a sales person called Stephen. He's worked for me for 10 years. Um, our designers, our writers, our photographers, but no, it wasn't enough. In January of this year, so this was all happening last November, and then in January of this year, uh, a new Terence Higgins Trust campaign for National HIV Prevention Week was booked into boys. It had been booked for months. Uh, we started talking to them about editorial pages. We used, we've done this campaign with them for 10 years. Uh, a front cover, a photo shoot. But then a few days later, we got an email from our THT contact we won't be running HIV testing week advertising in boys in the issues we discussed. However, we will be in touch in April about running a piece about our new trans sexual health resources. With apologies for the confusion, I had been misadvised. What was the point of the boys' apology if the very organization who had called for it wouldn't accept it and would no longer advertise with us? abdicating its duty to provide HIV prevention information to gay men. What about the gay men in this room who support the LGB Alliance, who maybe read boys? Do they not deserve HIV prevention messages from the THT? Uh, I think many of you know, because I'm HIV positive myself and have been for 27 years, this really this decision really hurt. Yeah. THT receives six million pounds from the public purse, a combination of local and national government. It is effectively an HIV quango, funded by the taxpayer through Public Health England. And now with the Charity Commission demanding charity leaders stop imposing their woke ideas on their organizations, maybe this is one of the uh, questions for the MPs uh, on the panel today. But of course, every cloud has a silver lining. And it was directly out of the THT's decision to boycott boys that I decided to launch Lesbian and Gay News. <laughs> Within six weeks of the THT's decision, LGN was published, uh, was starting publishing. And we published news stories from the great Joe Bartosz, who's here, uh, columns from Julie Bindle, who I think is here, and Gary Powell, uh, legal commentary, as we've heard, from Dennis Kavanagh, and even articles from James Dreyfus, which I thought Yay. made the point. And throughout, young Graham here was writing confidentially and very supportively to me. Here's my advice, he said. Take back your apology. They won't accept it anyway. And you will look like a hero in the longer term. Or in the long term. <laughs> Let me just carry on a moment. Gra uh, Graham also said, these people don't forgive, don't forget. 
I feel like a better option is to plant your flag firmly on the GC gender critical side. At least then, if you go down, you go down swinging. Yeah. <laughs> and Graham very perceptively added, I do think there's an audience hungry for this stuff. Yeah. So thank you, Graham. <laughs> They, they tried to cancel us, but in fact, they have only made us stronger. It is still a commercial battle with boys. We're still online. But interestingly, we continue to get advertising from theatres, films, and books. Perhaps three places where this debate will increasingly be aired. Most recently, Kubar and its owner, Gary Henshaw, literally one of the oldest boys' magazine advertisers and one of my longest-running friendships on the gay scene, put this out on Twitter. I would like to take this opportunity to apologize unreservedly for showing any support for a publication that has any association in the undermining of the trans community. I will cut all ties with Boys Magazine with immediate effect. He was like the final stalwart from the gay scene that was still supporting us, or had been. But interestingly, I hope for you, Gary at least had the decency to phone me, but only after he had posted that message. He told me, I think I'm making a big mistake, David, but what can I do? Well, he could have stood firm against... He could have stood, he could have stood firm against the person who targeted Kubar that had just reopened after lockdown, and that person was David Paisley. Our two publications will continue to challenge the gender dialogues who are trying to tear our lesbian and gay community apart. Boys reporting gay men's health and their sexual and emotional attraction to other biological men, and LGN, with your generosity through the crowdfunder, I thank you very much for that, reporting lesbian and gay news, commentary and culture. Even in the nine months I've been running LGN, I can assure you of this, as we've heard today, change is afoot. And finally, to misquote the American suffragette Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the best protection any woman can have and the best protection any lesbian, gay, or bi bisexual person can have is courage. David, thanks so much for that. Um, and I've been listening to Helen Joyce this morning, and she was talking about, you know, the first things authoritarian states do is to take people's livelihoods away. I, I immediately thought of, 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 of David in that regard. Um, David, I don't know how you've managed to survive it, but you have more than survived it, because we all love the LG news. <laughs> <laughs> So moving on to the political field, I think it's quite extraordinary that we would normally, normally look to our governments and our political parties to speak out against bullying that we just heard about, uphold freedom of speech, but instead it seems that the governments and political parties appear to be as much riven with division than anywhere else, uh, and possibly with the vicious attacks on MPs who dare to question identity theory. So on our panel today are the MPs who are not cowards. In fact, <laughs> in fact, they're the, the definition of political bravery in my book. Um, I'm very pleased that we've got MPs across the political divide, from Labour, L Labour, Tories, and. Who am I talking about? <laughs> Labour Tories and SNP. Um, sorry about that. Still, still just. So probably I would say the government that's most captured by gender identity activists is the SNP in Scotland. They're bringing in new gender recognition legislation to enable self-ID, as far as I know it. There's new census legislation which eliminates the question of biological sex. And we've got several screening adverts that don't mention women. And a lot more, I'm sure Joanna will tell us about. Joanna Cherry, MP in QC, has been one of the leading figures in the SNP for many, many years. She was recently Shadow Home Secretary and Justice Secretary at Westminster, 
until she dared to disagree with the party's self-ID and subsequently was sacked from her front bench roles. So, Joanna, I'm so happy that you've come here. Um, I just want to start with a very open question. What the hell is happening in Scotland? <laughs> I'm going to stand here because I, I quite like uh, standing at a lectern because I used to be a, a lawyer before I was a politician. <laughs> um, I suppose a lot of you don't really know me that well, so I thought I would just introduce myself by reading out to you the apology which Pink News had to print. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I um, successfully uh, threatened them with legal action a couple of years ago for wrongfully reporting that I was being investigated for homophobia, which would have been a bit strange <laughs> um, when you think about it, as I've been out as a dyke for 30 years. So anyway, <laughs> so, so this is what they said. Last week, we published and tweeted a story claiming that Joanna Cherry, QC, the MP for Edinburgh Southwest, and the SNP Justice and Home Affairs spokesperson was being investigated for homophobia. This claim was untrue, and we'd like to apologize unreservedly to Ms. Cherry. It's well known that Ms. Cherry is a human rights lawyer. She came out as a lesbian over 30 years ago and campaigned against Section 28. She spent a lifetime marching and campaigning for the rights of the LGBT plus community, and as a politician, regularly speaks up for their rights in Parliament and beyond. It was not our intention, nor is it in our interest to... <laughs> this is quite com com comic, really. It's not our intention, nor is it in our interest, to alienate any member of the LGBT plus community. <laughs> and we're truly sorry for the harm caused. We are happy also to confirm that we've made a donation to the Lesbian and Gay Immigration Group at Ms Cherry's request in compensation for the damage done, and we've paid her legal costs. And in a statement, Ms Cherry said, I'm pleased that the Pink News has withdrawn this damaging and hurtful allegation. I believe in equal rights for everyone. It's not acceptable for lesbians who speak up for women and girls' rights and against hateful speech and abuse to be denigrated. I hope the LGBTI plus movement can resume its previous habit of respectful debate over differences of opinion within the community. Well, that hope was a wee bit misplaced. But, <laughs> but, um, so I'm going to leave it to another speaker later this afternoon to talk a bit about what's happening in Scotland. Um, because as you already know, I was sacked from the front bench of the SNP, despite being the only person in the party who's ever laid a glove on Boris Johnson. Apologies to our Tory friends. <laughs> um, but uh, when I led the Scottish pro, uh, anti prorogation case and beat him in the Supreme Court. But nevertheless, I was sacked because I've spoken out in favour of lesbian, gay, and bisexual rights, and because I've spoken out for women's rights. And I don't want to stand here and criticise the SNP Scottish Government because I don't want to be expelled from my party, which I think could happen to me because I came into politics um, seven years ago during the Scottish independence referendum, primarily uh, to try and win independence for Scotland. And I thought that would be the fight of my life. But at that time, I didn't realise that what probably is uh, now the fight of my life would be to protect women's rights and also to protect the rights of, of lesbians and gay men and bisexual people. But I just want to say a little bit about what my experience has been and to fully endorse what David has said about the importance of standing up uh, against um, the bullies. Although, my goodness me, sometimes it's really not easy. But I have to say it's been made easier for me by the amazing support I have received from the lesbian, gay and bisexual community, indeed from some people in the trans community, and also from people in all political parties. And I'm really, really uh, grateful uh, for that. So I suppose the first time I started to realise that something a bit odd was going on was when I went to Pride in London in 2016, when I hadn't been to Pride in London, I don't think, since 1990. And I was absolutely 
gobsmacked at how much it had changed and how it just seemed to be some big corporate jamboree with everybody waving, waving posters saying trans rights or human rights, but nothing about LGB rights anywhere. And I wondered why the motion, the, the march was taking so long to start. And then I heard that there were a bunch of lesbians protesting at the front. And I thought, oh, good, I'm glad there's some lesbians protesting here. It seemed to be <laughs> any other. And then I had a similar experience when I spoke at Pride in Edinburgh the same year, when my speech was interrupted by Patrick Harvey. And no, it wasn't James Dreyfus doing his wonderful impersonation of Patrick Harvey. <laughs> It was actually Patrick Harvey just whipping the crowd into a frenzy, screaming trans rights or human rights. And I sensed some antipathy towards myself, but I, I couldn't quite really understand what it was. Um, but gradually I began to realize what was going on. And I suppose I really came into this because of my interest in human rights. And uh, I'm um, on the Joint Committee of Human Rights um, at uh, Westminster, which is a joint committee of the Commons and the Lords Cross Party that, that looks at legislation and current issues with, from a human rights perspective. And we were, actually, we were actually looking at the abuse of female MPs online. And I questioned a Twitter executive about why it is that Twitter will take down um, posts that say women don't have penises, but they will leave up for days on end posts of men pointing guns at women saying shut the fuck up turf and that they don't seem to find that offensive. <laughs> and, we kind of sort of started to get to the bottom of that when we realised that Twitter's hateful conduct policy doesn't include sex as a protected characteristic. Doesn't that sound uh, familiar? And, and we, uh, we published a cross-party report that said that it should do so, but I don't think uh, they've changed it. But the reaction to the, the clip of, um, of, of me interviewing the Twitter executive brought a reaction which I could never really have anticipated. It brought something nice as well. I met my current partner as a result of it. <laughs> <laughs> because she came to the SNP club in Edinburgh to hear me speak because she'd seen the clip and dot, dot, dot. But anyway, <laughs> to, to, to get back to May 2019, the reaction to this was incredible. And one of the, I got many, many death threats, but one was deemed by the Metropolitan Police and by Police Scotland to be a credible death threat because it was made in response to us publishing the whereabouts of my constituency surgery that week. And so I had to attend... Um, my surgery in a very douce suburb of Edinburgh, where anyone from Scotland will know Collington, it's one of the posh bits in my constituency. I had to attend the, my constituency surgery with um, a van load of police officers outside. And that's when I started to realize that thing, something really, 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 really nasty, nasty um, was going on. And then I think it's fair to say, I'm not going to bore you with the intricacies of Scottish politics, but there is a degree of disagreement in my party about the correct way forward to deliver an independent Scotland. <laughs> and I was perhaps always a slightly more radical voice than the current leadership. And for that reason, I think there were many people who wished me to be sidelined. And I think this has been a convenient issue with which to attack me because I have absolutely refused to back down on the importance of sex as a protected characteristic. Um, <laughs> and, sec and also sexual orientation. And of course now, uh, thank goodness, thanks to Maya, I can also bang on about the importance of gender critical beliefs, which is really driving people north of the border nuts. So thanks Maya. <laughs> But earlier this year, um, a series of circumstances took place which, which led to me being sacked from the SNP front bench. And on the day I was sacked, I received a series of very menacing uh, private messages. It, there weren't tweets, there were private messages uh, threatening me with, essentially threatening me with corrective rape. And, and it turned out that these came from somebody who was actually a member of the SNP. And uh, this man was prosecuted. Um, successfully, um, and uh, I find it really quite horrifying and troubling that nobody in my political party has felt able to publicly condemn the rape threats that were made against me and the, 
Now, I know I've had many private uh, messages of support from the membership of the Scottish National Party, and I know people are scared to speak out because they've seen what's happened to me and others um, for speaking out. But I very much fear that we are creating in our society a category, and I think it really is a category of women. I know men are affected sometimes, but I think overwhelmingly it's a category of women who can be abused, threatened, and indeed, as we saw at Speaker's Corner in London, assaulted with impunity, notwithstanding the epidemic of violence we currently face against women and girls. And so I suppose, you know, you won't be unaware of some of the criticism that I've received on Twitter as a result of my decision to speak here today. And I can assure you that is the tip of the iceberg of what has gone on behind the scene. So I want to be very clear about how I approach uh, this debate in which we find ourselves. I, of course, support equal rights for trans people. It would be rather extraordinary if someone who's a human rights lawyer and a supporter of equal rights their whole life didn't support equal rights um, for uh, trans people. But this is not a row about trans rights. As Alison correctly said earlier, it's an ex existential crisis, not just for lesbian, gay and bisexual people, not just for women, but for our politics, our government and our institutions, and I include in that our great universities, because if we allow no debate to triumph in one area of public policy, then we're on the slippery slope to tyranny. <laughs> I, you know, I think, um, I think the tide is turning, and it's impossible for me, given the man's politics and his attitude towards my country and my country's right to self-determination, to applaud Boris Johnson. But I recognise the significance for people south of the border in the supportive statement he's given to this conference. But I suppose, you know, my, I'm really speaking to the left now um, and the left tradition which I come from and my own party, the Scottish National Party, and also... Uh, the Labour Party, of which I would be a member if I lived in England. Don't leave it to the right to defend free speech. And don't leave it to the right to defend the Equality Act, which was the creation of a Labour government. So I think the tide, the tide is turning, but I think the law will be, has been and will be a very important weapon in the turning of that tide. Because e thanks to Maya's victory, and also thanks to the fight and the stand that Alison's taking, everyone in this room now knows that if they are discriminated against, harassed, or victimized by their employer, or their political party, or their golf club, they can turn round and say, you are breaching the Equality Act on account of my same-sex orientation and my gender critical beliefs. And I think that's going to be a very powerful weapon going forward. As, as will be testing uh, legislation, against the standards of the European Convention of Human Rights and in relation to the legislation of the devolved governments against the standards set in the Equality Act and the need to make sure that all protected characteristics are given equal protection and that no one protected characteristic is set on a platform above everybody else. So I feel quite optimistic. I feel the tide is turning. I feel there's still an awful lot of work to be done, but I, I can't tell you the joy I feel at being here today. I feel like I've gone back in time. It, it's just so wonderful for, to see lesbians and gay men and bisexual people with our straight allies and our trans allies working together again to further lesbian, gay and bisexual rights. Thank you.
Thank you, Joanna. That was wonderful. Um, I just wanted to ask you one question. Uh, you said previously that you thought your political career was over, but then you are effectively over. But then more recently you said you were going to stand and fight. So which is it? I'm going to stand and fight. <laughs> I can't I tell you this, I know I've got the support of my constituents and I know I've got the support of my constituency party and I think I have the support of the overwhelming majority of the SNP membership. But more importantly, I cannot walk up a street in Scotland without some, anywhere in Scotland, not just Edinburgh, which I represent and live in, anywhere in Scotland, without somebody stopping me in the street and thanking me for the stance I've taken on women's rights. And sometimes they mention LGB rights as well, it's usually women's rights. And frequently they'll start off by saying to me, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a unionist or I don't vote SNP, but I really want to thank you for what you've done. So I know that there's a lot of support out there. And I know that the reason why it is so important for some people to silence people like us is because once we start talking about the nuance and the facts and the reality, People get it and they understand that extreme gender identity theory is dangerous. Thanks, Joanna, that was, that was fantastic. Um, just moving on to uh, my right now, um, probably the party that's shown the biggest public split in the issue of uh, gender identity is the Labour Party. And I think we all found it almost painful. I really felt sorry for Sir Keir Starmer. On the <laughs> I mean, it was painful. On the Andrew Marr show, being asked the question, why can't we say only women have a cervix? And he said, it's just wrong, or something like that. Uh, the, the personification of that split um, is here with us today, the MP for Canterbury, Rosie Duffield. And Rosie... <laughs> I really don't need to introduce her, but I'll just say, Rosie, she's relatively new to Parliament, 2017 intake, but she impressed the whole House of Commons by speaking very personally and movingly about the of effects of domestic abuse. But then she got this wave of condemnation. I think the spectator said it was a tsunami of hatred from within her own party just for liking a tweet. I started with a tweet again. People with a cervix are called women. Didn't take much. So, um, first of all, Rosie, thank you so much for being here and for standing up um, for women's rights. And I can only imagine that it's not easy for you to be here, probably more than anywhere else on the platform. And uh, I was a bit worried you were going to wobble and, uh, and I would have an empty chair there, which would have been a good story in itself. But uh, <laughs> I'm much glad, I uh, very much happier that you're here, and I know that the three of you do actually, despite your political differences, uh, talk a lot with each other and support each other, which I think is fantastic. So I just want to ask you a couple of questions, actually, Rosie, but you, you know, this is what you like to say, but do you think that women's rights are taking second place to other rights within the labour movement? Hello, and first of all, thank you very much for having me, and... Uh, this feels like such a safe space compared to kind of a few meters across the room. <laughs> and what struck all of us actually when we came in was that not only are we seeing really familiar, friendly faces, but there are also people we don't recognize from the circuit that we've kind of got used to. So that's even more exciting. You know, there's, there's more and more people and it seems to be growing but but yeah we're very we're, we're sort of on our own in parliament and when I got elected and I was sort of a 50-50 parliament ambassador which is to try and get 50% women and 50% men across the the house uh, I always made speeches saying that we were women first and party political partisan second and that is very true um, and these guys have been there by my side for the last kind of year or so. And we, we can't do anything without each other now. You know, I look out for these two in Parliament. And the same goes with Tonya and Tignancy, who couldn't be here today. But... <laughs> 
She's so much more strategic than me and, and sort of pragmatic and practical and gets working on sort of policies and things behind the scenes, whereas I just open my big gob, I'm afraid. But, um, <laughs> but, but these guys really do sort of get me through every day, you know, especially when in your own party you feel incredibly lonely. And I'm chair of 101 women, Labour women, the biggest voting bloc in Parliament. But the 20% or so of that group who are of the same mind as, as me don't speak up and they're too frightened. So they're the people that I know of, you know, that's 20 odd people that I know of. I know of a lot more in, in the Tories and, and not so much, I'm afraid, in the SNP and the Lib Dems. But, but yeah, other rights. We're okay to talk about everyone else's rights, mm -hmm. but we're not supposed to talk about women and we're not supposed to talk about our bodies without quantifying it or justifying it or adding on other groups that we also support to sort of you know, have our credentials allowed. So we're not allowed to just speak about things that really only do affect women. Even, you know, I'm used to this when, when I did my domestic violence speech. Inevitably, I got the, the tweets saying, what about men? What about men? Men are abused too. Yes, of course. But my lived experience is that of 51% of the country and I know what it's like to be a woman. I don't know what it's like to be trans. Jermaine Greer, I think, was cancelled when she said on a program, I'm not here to talk about trans rights. It's not something I know about. I know about women's lived experience, but also having been raised by a woman whose friends were at Greenham Common. My mom was never quite well enough, actually, but her friends went to Greenham. There was always spare rib lying around. It was just normal for us to talk about gay rights, even in the 80s, where it wasn't actually that normal, but in my house it was. Um, my dad was a policeman, which isn't exactly well known for being, you know, but, but my parents are quite woke, actually. And, um, and we talked about these things, and it was normal. And I was, you know, f for me to be called homophobic is the most insulting and yeah. distressing thing I think I've ever <laughs> had to deal with. And, and for, for to be kind of you know, not able to go to Pride in Canterbury it was incredibly hurtful, but, I, you know, I was told it, w it wouldn't be safe for me to go. So I can't shut up and I can't sort of be quiet. But, but yes, this idea that women's rights are... We have to justify mm. talking about them. It's just completely ridiculous. And I'm afraid my party is an absolute embarrassment at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a couple of questions, because I, I think it is my, my, I think it is quite fascinating. Is this mic working? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Um, I mean, wh why, why, why has a Labour Party taken this stance? I just can't see it. I mean, given even for cynical electoral reasons, I mean, women are fifty-one percent of the population. Trans and you know minorities are much less than that. But wh wh why are they turning against their own? women's groups? It's a really good question. There are a couple of very prominent Labour women who've been asked why they're not supporting me or why they're not out there. Mm. And I'm not going to name names, but, but one's been a politician for a very long time. And you would think it was really her kind of thing. And I happen to know that the person who leads her CLP is viciously uh, trans women and women and trans rights activists. And I think people are frightened. I think if you look at all the abuse that women get anyway in political life, the fact that our own party is riddled with all of this and supposed to be so woke about everything, I think it's just fear of yet more abuse. And every time I like a tweet or, you know, do anything that's, that's kind of vaguely gender critical, I have to draw breath. I have to make a decision about whether I'm doing it. Even the words that I'm saying today, I'm kind of, I have this weird reverberation in my head. And when I'm live on the radio, like I was on today, you kind of, it's like those two second delays when you have a live program. You're kind of going, oh, is that okay? So you can't even really speak as you would, say, me and Graham were on the phone. We'd have a completely different kind of conversation. And it's really bizarre, but it's just fear. It's fear. That's the only answer. Thank you. Uh, just one last question. Um, Sir Keir said he'd spoken to you at a discussion, I know you asked for a discussion. Have you had a discussion with him? I first texted Keir in June this year, which was a year after I'd first been sort of cancelled by the whole world. And I'd kind of gone through this whole year and met you guys and, and been supported by you all. And uh, it took me a long time to be brave, and I wish I had earlier, but, but anyway, I'm here now. And uh, I, I said to... <laughs> Thank you.
I said to Keir that I, I just was kind of waiting for him to say something. I was waiting for him to approach me as a leader. And, and I thought, you know, it's essentially you're my boss. You probably look in on me and just see if I was okay reading all the abuse. Mm. And I thought, perhaps he doesn't read it. And all this stuff has been going through my head for a year until I thought, I'll just do it then. So I texted him and said, Keir, I really think we should meet. And it was, it was one of the many times where I'm teaching on the edge of, can I carry this on? Yeah. Can I stay in this party? You know, it happens every now and again, and, uh, and I said, please, can we meet? You know, I'm really struggling. And he was like, of course, of course. And he always replies to me straight away, which doesn't happen to everyone. And, uh, and this went on, and then September, I tried again, and I thought, look, conference is coming up. It had been leaked, and, and I was not behind the story. I didn't want anyone to know that I wasn't going to conference. I wanted to quietly just not go. But it had been leaked that I, was go I wasn't going because of the, the trans activists and things. And he said, yes, yes, of course, we'll go. So a few days before conference, we did meet. And I thought it was great, you know, 40 minutes, just him and I, just chatting. And then the second that he was asked about it, because he said he would talk about it, he, he went and said that. And I really don't understand why. I really, really don't understand that. That wasn't the nature of our meeting. I asked him why he hadn't met Lesbian Labour or Labour and Women's Declaration, because Labour Women's Declaration have 7,000 open signatures from Labour members, Labour councillors, Labour activists. I don't understand why that group haven't been able to get in front of him. He said he would do something. I, st I don't know if he has. No? OK. Thanks. And David Lammy, who's, who's yeah. CLP there from... <laughs> Doesn't seem to know anything either. So, so that's that's it. We have women's met. biology. And I think I saw, saw your cervix. Night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I saw Keir last night. I saw Keir last night, and I said, "Look, I'm trying to be supportive of you as our leader." And he said, "I know, I know." And then he got whisked away. So I, I don't know. Oh. I don't know. Surprise! What's going surprise. On there, but, but yeah. Well, can I just say, th Rosie, thank you for your bravery, because uh, I know it is really tough, and I deserve a big. Take a bow. Thank you. So, moving on to my third political <laughs> guest, uh, Jackie Doyle Price, who, of course, is a conservative. <laughs> I want to come out and say I'm a Tory too, so <laughs> <laughs> speak up for the Tories. Um, but uh, Jackie's been at the forefront of women's rights uh, all of her political life. She was appointed Minister for Mental Health, I think, uh, under Theresa May. Uh, she's campaigned for women's mental health, working with rape crisis centres. And I think she was one of the first women, in fact, the first woman to stand up in Parliament and warn against the dangers of the new gender ideology sweeping all the other parties. So the Tory party is only one that's not been totally captured. There's still work to be done, as um, Alison said. And the Tory party did flirt, um, Jackie, if I can ask you this question, with self-ID legislation, eliminating biological sex from the census, but they rolled back. Were, could you have been any part of changing their minds? Um, I think we all were, uh, actually, in truth. Um, but it comes back to what Alison said in her keynote address. And... The problem for the Conservative Party is, at the moment, it's suffering from collective guilt over Section 28. Um, I think, you know, all of us, are, you know, looking back, Section 28 was very much a product of the politics of its time, but it's not something that the modern-day Conservative Party wishes to be associated with in any way, shape or form. And I think that's what's led the Conservative Party collectively to be rather inhibited uh, by the, the issues surrounding this debate. Um, I think we ended up in a position of uh, supporting self-ID purely because uh, the figures that were around at that time, the, the leading women figures, just felt this was the natural progression of the advancement of rights. And it took people like me, not me, not me alone, uh, but many conservative women MPs, and thank goodness we've got many more of them than we used to have, uh, because we could actually make, make some noise about it. But, you know, this was a kind of moment where we said, come on, get real. You've got to think about what you're really doing here. You know, there is a reason why we have sex-based rights. There is a reason we have women-only safe spaces. And if you legislate to give the right to self-identification on gender access to those spaces, you are giving a license to male sexual predators to take advantage of that. And it, 
this is one of the arguments I constantly have with with my colleagues in the party in LGBT uh, conservatives who say, why are you so afraid of trans people? Well, the answer to that is I'm not afraid of trans people, but I am afraid of male predators. <laughs> and the, the truth of the matter is, we can't talk, you know, we can't have the whole political establishment hand-wringing about male violence against women and girls, whilst at the same time not being prepared to take on these arguments, and frankly, running away from them, because that's the truth of the matter of what's happening in the Labour Party. <laughs> when, when Rosie talks about this, She's an inconvenience because she's forcing her party to face up to what is a conflict of rights and to actually say something sensible about it. Now, within the Conservative Party, we are having a more healthy discussion about those things, but actually it's still not healthy. And I, and I think the real reason for that is this hangover of Section 28. But, but collectively, we are changing the discussion. And I have to say, I'm really grateful to my sisters here because it really helps that they're prepared to do their bit too. <laughs> It's great to see the sisterhood all on stage together. Um, just wanted to ask you a couple of questions, uh, Jackie. The, there are still divisions within the Tory party, I think. Um, Stonewall still wields quite a lot of influence um, at number 10. Now that Stonewall's facing a lot more scrutiny, we've got great columnists now who are calling them out. We've got the excellent Stephen Nolan radio documentary, which I'm sure you've all seen. <laughs> Um, and I know there's, you know, specific loyalties within the higher echelons of the party, but do you think that um, the Tory party and the government will follow the lead of Ofcom and HRC and Liz Truss and start to untie that knot with Stonewall? Uh, the short answer to that is yes. And you, but <laughs> again, with all these things, we, we have Stonewall so embedded in our public organisations and it's an embedding that's taken you know, decades, that to reverse that juggernaut takes an awful lot of energy, to be frank. And it needs to be, have ministers who really give a damn to push these departments for withdrawing. So, so you had Robert Buckland uh, withdraw uh, from the MOJ because it was something he cared about. You've, but you've still got an awful lot of government departments that are still members, notwithstanding the very real concerns that, that Liz has expressed. So you know, it's still a work in, in progress. And, but I would say, say this as well, the truth of the matter is, and, and no organization has felt this more than LGBLIs, Stonewall is a blooming powerful brand. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, actually it's fantastic, these, the, the Stephen Nolan uh, podcast, we must make sure that those get out so that this, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant, I've always said. And the more we can see and broadcast exactly how they've established the position they are in now, then we can actually start rolling that back and having sensible policy making based on the law. Because the Equalities Act is very clear. And I, I, cannot, I cannot fathom how an organization can get away with willfully misrepresenting the law to the government that is there to enforce it. I mean, it's bananas, but we, we will carry on. Uh, thanks, Jackie. That's great. I just wanted to say that we, I think I'm allowed to say that the LGB Alliance small delegation did have a meeting at number 10. And uh, it was interesting because uh, what we were told was there was a lot of support there, really high up. But they said, you've really got to prove that LGB Alliance isn't just a kind of fringe niche group. Because bulk matters, noise matters, famous people matter. And I think, you know, after this conference, you know, all of us in the, in the Alliance are going to get together and think, how can we convince the government that we are not niche? We're the opposite of niche. We're the majority. We're speaking for the majority. And I think anyone who's got any good ideas on that, please come to me. <laughs> But thank you very much, uh, Jackie. Um, <laughs> so leaving politics behind for a bit and coming back to the real world again, um, just in case anyone forgets Finally. who... <laughs> just in case anyone forgets... What forget, does a straight white guy have to do to get hair? I uh, know, don't blame me. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, you were straight. <laughs> um, I just wanted to remind people who Graham, Graham is. Until recently, he was best known for being the genius creator of Father Ted. <laughs> Not just that, the IT crowd. <laughs> Count Arthur Strong. <laughs> Black Books. <laughs> and also contributing classics like The Fast Show and Brass Eye. Can I just say, as a, a former TV producer myself, I mean, that's the most amazing collection of, of, of comedy and, um, and creativity. And very, very few people you'll ever meet in the creative sector will have had anything like the CV that, that Graham's got. So it's a real, real pleasure to have you here. But it was just because of your stance on gender ideology, you seem to have gone from comedy king to a media pariah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so do you think you're now unemployable in TV sector? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I'll give you an example of one thing that happened. There's a show on at the moment that people might know. It's uh, with Steve Martin and Martin Short. I don't know if people have seen it. Yeah, it's supposed to be very good. Uh, I was supposed to direct that. I got a call and they offered, they gave it to me. And uh, then I got a call half an hour later and the guy said, sorry, I forgot we've, we've offered it to someone else. <laughs> And I know exactly what happened. He went to the office and he said, hey, everyone, I've got Graham Linehan. And someone said, oh, he's a bigot. And that's the end of that, you know? So, you know, it, it is what it is. I kind of realized early on it would be like that. I, I got into this whole thing because I had cancer and I got a payout of um, some money. And I thought, well, they're going to go after my livelihood. So I'll use this money to, to just survive for a while and just kind of, and kind of, you know, concentrate on this stuff because I, because I genuinely thought it would be over really quickly. <laughs> you know, I mean, Julie Bindle and Miranda Yardley must be laughing their heads off. At, 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 <laughs> but I, but I, gen, I genuinely thought as soon as I said young girls are, are having unnecessary double mastectomies, mm -hmm. men are being put in women's prisons, men are even being called, you know, paedophiles being called she in in newspapers. I thought everyone would be like, how can we help? I thought all my colleagues in the industry would, would mm. rally. And it's just been silence for four years. It's gone on for me as long as the Second World War, nearly. <laughs> you know? I know I, I use those metaphors a lot. People don't like it. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but um, the other thing I had going for me was the Father Ted musical. Because I thought, well, I'll do this, and they can't stop the Father Ted musical. That's too big to fail, you know? Uh, capitalism won't allow the TED musical not to get made. But then COVID happened. Mm. And so I was, I was kind of spinning in the wind for, for a number of years. So yeah, this is my job now. Um, but I started, I started as a journalist um, and I'm really delighted to be back to being one. You know, I, I, um, not only that, but before all this happened, I was in a bit of a media bubble. Um, I, I only really knew people in the media. Now I know no one in the media. <laughs> and, uh, and I know people like Joanna and Rosie and, and, and everyone who's here. I mean, just some of the most bravest, most fantastic people from all walks of life. You know, I've met, I've, I've met social workers. I've met like policemen, police women. I've, you know, uh, I, I'm so proud to be to be um, so closely associated with 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 these incredible women from the LGB Alliance. Um, I can't tell you how, how much that enriches my writing, mm. you know? I feel like I, I, I was kind of rolling to a stop with my TV career. The, my last show, no one watched it, you know? And I didn't make much money from it. And I thought, well, this is not making any more financial sense for me to do. Um, so, so this fight has just kind of enriched m me as a writer in a way that I think was just what I needed. I'm having a laugh to myself here because <laughs> I asked Graham, can you be positive, please? Because we're wanting. <laughs> Is this positive? Is this positive? Okay. I'm trying I, to be I'm positive. Just, thank you. <laughs> David no. called me young earlier. Which was great, Fif <laughs> 53 years old, but uh, which I believe is 83 in gay years. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, David. <laughs> Graham said to me, I really only do angry Eileen. Are you sure you want me on the panel? 
Um, Can I also say, like, I mean, uh, the thing is, my, my toxicity is such that I'm, I'm really honoured that, that you all are sitting up on stage with me. Oh. You know? No, no, I, I really am. I really yes. am. I mean, you know, I keep getting bursts again. Every time I hit the news, they won't, they won't talk about the money we raised for Vancouver rape relief. They won't talk about all the stories we've broken. We've broken some amazing stories. We caught David Lammy lying, you know, uh, yeah. a few weeks ago. Um, I have some amazing, amazing writers working for me. Um, they ignore all of that stuff. But if I slip up, mm -hmm. there was a four second video of me at the Welsh uh, protest mm. that went around where I misspoke. Um, that, that completely, they just edited out the end of that sentence, so it made me look like an idiot. And that's what they do, that's what Pink News does, mm. that's what all these organizations do. They cannot, cannot win an argument. So all they can do is attack us on spurious, <laughs> insulting grounds. I, I was just I was just going to ask about that because you have been, you know, you've been totally closed down. I mean, sorry, you've been totally closed down. Yeah. I mean, you, I, you won't get any inv invitations on BBC or Question Time or no, they, they, um, Twitter. Clo your Twitter account closed. Still? So yeah, tw I, I got shut off Twitter. I'd love to talk to you about that, Joanne, because mm -hmm. um, because uh, you spoke to Katie Minshall, of course, and uh, I believe the order to get rid of me and Stuart Campbell from Wings Over Scotland came from the London offices. So uh, if you can do anything about following up with her, that would be great. Because, uh, because you know, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, but like, uh, um, yeah, like I noticed, someone said John Cleese was starting up a show about cancel culture. And as soon as I heard it, I thought, well, I'm not gonna be on it. Because there's canceled and there's canceled, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so like, like, you know, I just noticed that I, Stephen Nolan didn't speak to me at all, which is fine. I didn't really need him to. I'm, I'm delighted with what he did. But it's like my toxicity is is pretty incredible. Well, you've not been cancelled from this platform, and that's for sure, no, Jim. Well, I'm really, really pleased to have you here. I, and I'm really... I, I genuinely... I, you know, I mean, I... I uh, the police were called on me three three times so far, uh, twice by Adrian Harp and Stephanie Hayden, who are two associates, um, one of whom is a con man, one of whom is a is uh, is up against a, a medical board next month, along with Helen Weberly, another villain in all this, um, and uh, those kinds of things. Like the Guardian ran a story when Stephanie Hayden. Uh, call the police on me, and that's the thing that's used against me every time. Yes. And this is a person who's no, I mean, had multiple con convictions, you know? I mean, it's, um, it's extraordinary who they listen to and who they, 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 they platform. I just don't, I don't understand the Guardian yeah. stance. I mm. just don't get it. I think that's very true. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the extraordinary thing about David's stories and Graham's stories is it doesn't seem enough to just cancel someone and stop them talking. Actually, you've got to ruin lives, ruin oh, their lives. I'll, I'll, and I mean, why is it not enough just to shut you up? I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, 25 years ago, um, I had a, a website called Why That's Delightful. And every, after every episode of the IT Crowd, I opened up a page about it and invited people to come in and, and chat about it. For not really, because I was so naive, I didn't realize how awful the internet is at that stage. And uh, after a while, a, a website, called Cooked and Bombed uh, kind of uh, got wind of it and came in and just filled it with invective and insults and you stole this and you did this, and you did that. And eventually I had to shut it down because it was so toxic, you know? Um, mm. 25 years later, those guys are still meeting in a forum and talking about how, uh, like what they said at one point, what was it they said? They said, they said it's a bit crushing that he's making money from his substack. I was hoping after the divorce that destitution would be his next stop. So oh, these, are, these are comedy like rejects who have been following me for 25 years and they're using trans rights as a way of bringing me down. It's, just, you know? it's, it's beyond words, I have to say. But, but you must, uh, that's one thing to remember about this. And I think Julie Birchall, I know Julie Birchall is, uh, you know, I don't agree with her in everything, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, she did say, she did say that this is the revenge of the wallflower against the ballerina. 
It's the revenge of all the people who, who couldn't really do the one thing they wanted to do mm -hmm. and are resentful about it. And they've yeah. found a way to try and climb up the, yeah. you know, using, using, using people as a ladder, yeah. you know? And, and I, I really think that the nature of trans rights activism has to be investigated a little bit more. Yeah, it's absolutely. not really about trans people. No, I think that's completely right. Thank you very much, Liam. Now, we're a wee bit, wee bit pressed for time, but um, I want to just throw over to the audience if there's any questions. Yes, is that Alex? No, who's that at the back? Yes, this is, this, is, this is the famous Alex, wearing his beanie hat. <laughs> I, I, just before Alex, which Alex uh, was, was attacked. Was it Manchester Pride? Just for wearing a beanie hat. And the sales of our beanie hats have gone through the roof. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Eileen, and thank you for all the fantastic speakers and this fantastic conference and the support um, everyone's given me personally, the real love, the real pride I feel again I've felt since at being gay, at being part of LGB, and being, I think, same sex attraction, being able to experience that in an amazing community has been fantastic. Um, I've got a question um, aimed at the uh, three MPs here. I'm wondering um, what you see as the opportunities or threats on the political horizon um, for free speech. And I'm thinking especially of uh, the debate we're going to see on conversion therapy, because that looks to me as if the harrowing experiences, the tortures that have been suffered uh, by people under so-called so conversion therapy is being weaponized um, in the, in the noise of, of pushing this gender ideology. And I wonder what your thoughts are in that area and more generally for free speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll take that first because um, this issue first crossed my desk when I was Minister for Mental Health and responsible for th that whole area of, of, of policy. And of course, you know, anything coercive to, you know, so-called cure people of their sexuality is absolutely abhorrent and should, should, not, should not ever happen. Uh, what wasn't clear to me was just the extent of it. And for me, the term conversion therapy is a really misleading one because it's not been used in a therapeutic context in this country since post-1970. So what we're talking about, frankly, what we're talking about is witchcraft, in truth. And uh, we're giving it a nice vanilla term, but, but that nice vanilla term could suffer from very serious mission creep. And in the, in the sphere of gender dysphoria, that is so dangerous. Because we all know, uh, those of us that have bothered to actually take time to think about it and get past the slogan, trans women, women, um, that gender dysphoria can be a symptom of many other things. It can be a symptom of trauma. It could be uh, it's, you know, a sign to someone's uh, neurodiverse conditions. It, there are any number of ways. And, and, and actually, for kids going through puberty, it's actually quite normal <laughs> uh, not to like what's happening to them. So therapeutic care pathways uh, regarding gender dysphoria are essential. Uh, you know, we must not just put people on a medical care pathway that leads to sterilization and removal of healthy body parts. And the fact that that happens <laughs> on the NHS suggests to me that there's something very, very seriously wrong with those so-called care pathways. So we need to be very, uh, and you know, I'm looking to my friends here, because, and I know they'll support me, but, <laughs> but I'm not going to run away from this argument. I am going to make sure that the whole issue of, tra uh, of gender medicine and trans medicine that, that conversion of therapy must not be applied in that context. Thanks, Jackie. Very, very reassuring. Um, could you give it to the lady in the, in the red, please? Is there a microphone? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Conrad. Hello, um, I'm Paula Bolton from Lesbian Labour. 
Um, it's a question to Jackie, but also to the whole uh, hall here, because I don't know. We are cross-party here, which is fantastic. I want to see lesbian conservatives, and I want to see lesbian liberals, and a lesbian SNP. So if you're, you know, on the floor, as opposed to in Parliament, get your group together, because it, it gives us another bite at this argument to be able to argue for same-sex attraction as lesbians, it gets us to be able to argue the women's issue as well. But I wanted to know, Jackie, where are the lesbians in the Tory party? <laughs> and, you know, what are they going to do? Uh, that's a very good question. I think that they are in LGBT conservatives. Actually, we did lose our uh, out lesbian member of parliament at the last general election, Margot. Uh, so she's no longer with us. Um, oh, and Justine also left. Yeah, Rose is just reminding me. Um, but yes, at the moment, we don't have any uh, out uh, lesbians uh, in Parliament, but they, they are all out there in the party. So, <laughs> yeah, come on, ladies, come out and be proud. We've got plenty of champions. But, but, I think, uh, but, but there, there is another issue, actually, within the Conservative Party, and that, you know, it is... Yeah, it, it, the clue's in the word, conservative. Um, it, it tends to be more traditional. <laughs> a clue. Women have been less successful at organising generally for a political, on a political basis, and we just need to make sure that happens. Thanks, Jackie, very much. Um, we're kind of running out of time, but uh, can I just want, I wanted to go to Rachel Ara just to say hello, because you've, as you in the audience, Rachel. Hello, Rachel, you've done some lovely digital work for us, uh, for arts and the, for the conference. And Rachel, I know that you've, I think sometimes it's the arts that seems to suffer more than any other area in terms of cancel culture, apparently because they all think themselves really, really decent people. But you've had a bit of your own cancellation, have you not? Yeah, yeah, they did an absolute hatchet job on me. And I think they did such a good job on me. Um, no one else there. Um, Follow, follow, follow me in a sense. I mean, it, it's like when Jess was sort of no platform in a sense by the RA. None of the Royal Academicians showed up. So now, I mean, my crime was liking three of Alison's tweets, so be careful. Um, and, yeah, and there's an organisation called Turfs Out of Art, and all you have to do is report an artist to them, and then they'll start emailing the union. So now I can't do any lectures. I mean, you know, I can't show anywhere because I rely on commissions. I, I was, my career was doing quite well, so I actually think it was... Um, utilized in a sense, but also about being, uh, having courage. I mean, yes, you know, you can have courage, but they came after my family as well. Yeah. So they went after my mother, they went after my niece. Oh, so nice. <clears throat> I've just been lying low for a tiny bit, but it's really, really difficult. Well, thanks for your carrying on and your bravery. I mean, I, and, I, just... I mean, you know, there's more to it. I've seen, I've been in big museums. I've seen gender critical people being decollected from national collections. This is a scandal. And this sort of stuff really needs to be written mm. about because, you know. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think the, I'm interesting, I'm being visual, I'm a visual artist, you know, that's how I express myself. I'm not a writer. And I think this argument is very much happening in the sort of written word. Mm. So it's sort of excluding visual people that relate to a, you know, a whole different audience. Well, if there are any of our great columnists from the various journals here, please go and talk to Rachel, and uh, this story has to get out. Um, Thank you. Have I, am I running out of time, Mr...? Yeah, I've been told to um, wrap up. Can I just say, uh, finally, a, a really, really big thank you uh, for coming here and giving your time and telling the stories. It's been devastating in some ways, but also we'd like to leave positively. We will be doing a, a manifesto. We'll be asking you all to contribute to see what's the one thing we can do to make changes. So we want to end positively. And on a positive note, I think, I think we might have a graphic, a letter that we had. Is it going to come up? Or is it... You read out. Thank you for stealing my last time. <laughs> Malcolm told me to do it. It's Malcolm. There you go. There we go. There we go. See the light. See man. Don't recognise him myself, but I'm sure he's someone very important. Anyway, thank you all very much, and uh, thanks to my panellists, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Tea break. Go and get a cup of tea.